All right, so I'm here at the JCP 15th anniversary party with Rob Jingle. And you were the second JCP chair? Yes, from about 2001 to 2004. Okay, so that's, that's been a while, but how were things different back in 2004 for the JCP? What was the, what was the climate like back then? Um, it was a period where in the industry, open source initiatives were starting to become lively and a number of groups, particularly the Apache Foundation, uh, were trying to participate in the JCP and similar efforts. And uh, the community was having to wrestle with the issues of how does open source relate to compatibility and how important is compatibility to the Java community um, and what are the tensions in that. And that was probably the largest issue that was current the whole time I was chair. Because um, actually my first uh, action was... Um, the Apache Foundation decided they couldn't participate on the executive committee. And to me, at that time, that seemed a ludicrous outcome. So we voided that election and, you know, did a lot of work with the community to talk about, so does open source necessarily interfere with Java's promise of compatibility to mm -hmm. its developers? You know, we have, at that time, roughly four million Java developers. Um, we believed, uh, Sun particularly, but I think the community at large believed that the reason there were four million developers was there was this cross-platform, new platform that allowed developers to work and have a large reach. Now, Java was also dependent on roughly 4,000 um, developers who were contributing to its evolution and the people who wanted to contribute to its evolution and who and the people who benefited from the existence of the Java platform had like a, you know 10,000 to 1 kind of ratio so the concern was particularly at a time when Sun had just gone through an expensive process with Microsoft over the corruption of the Java platform yeah. was how was it that all of these things could coexist? Does compatibility necessarily conflict with open source ideals and principles or can they coexist in some way? And how does that actually play out in practice? And at the time, I thought that was really important that we figure that out. I don't okay. know that any of us knew the answer to exactly how it should, but um, you know, sort of the opening of the time I was JCP chair was about bringing Apache into the organization and finding a way for them to contribute. Yeah, and it and, sounds like you were successful in that uh, To some degree. Um, you know, at the end of the time I was chair, there was a lot of contention about, well, should Java itself be open sourced? Um, I was the recipient of a somewhat notorious uh, <laughs> open letter from IBM that basically said, you know, you should open source Java. And, um, you know, the way we responded to that was at the next Java One, several months later, we had a, basically an open, unscripted conversation among all the contenders about, so why do we think the things we do, what are the values we're trying to protect? Uh, the value I opened with was the idea that, you know, our concern was that Java application developers not be lied to by things pretending to be Java. And of course, in the whole Microsoft legal action, that had actually occurred. This yeah. wasn't a theoretical problem. Now, at the time we were holding this discussion, it was probably true that the body of existing applications was sufficiently strong that you didn't really have to worry about the core platform fragmenting anymore. But all the new JSRs, like the new toaster JSR, yeah, was vulnerable. Those, those and, are things where if you didn't have standardization in a body where you could actually... Um, right. When there's a, a, when there's a whole collection of applications that are 
basically the surrogate for the test suite, yeah. they will hold you, right? And so the, the counter example is, you know, Linux didn't have a test suite. Well, what idiot, 40 years after the start of Unix, would build a version of Unix that didn't run the apps, right? <laughs> that would be stupid, right? <laughs> Nobody would do that. But at the beginning of each new JSR, they're all vulnerable to poaching due to understandable competitive pressures. And so the thing I wanted out of this, which in the end didn't really happen, maybe because it was too complicated, uh, was the idea that you know adults get to do things that children don't do. And maybe when JSRs are young, you have to be really rigorous about getting the spirit and content of that JSR to be in reality in the marketplace the thing that, you know, I said at the beginning that Java things, Java applications are not lied to by things pretending to be Java, but there becomes a point in their evolution when they're established enough, so you don't really have to worry about it anymore. And I think the idea that the standardization process might be temporally based was just really hard for people to digest. Um, then and now, actually. I mean, I think that's part of the, the issue is it's, it's actually complicated. It's got a lot of texture to it. Um, but actually, the thing I thought was most heartening about that was when I said the thing about, you know, Java programs should not be lied to by things claiming to be Java. Yeah. You know, the, the room erupted with applause, <laughs> right? It was sort of like, okay, so we're actually pursuing the right issue for the audience. Um, so that was certainly gratifying. And I, I know later a number of the issues that were part of making that happen became, you know, erupted a bit. That Sun basically reneged on some of the promises we made at that time. Uh, I had already left Sun at that point, which I guess was a good thing because I probably would have had to lead it, leave it then <laughs> uh, if I hadn't already because... You know, I think uh, we really thought those things were important for the community. But, um, you know, here it's 10 years later. I haven't really been involved since um, I left the JCP and Sun itself. And uh, it's actually pretty gratifying to see that this process still exists, that it continues to thrive with a number of these same tensions in place. And maybe that's actually a sign of success, that uh, something that has so many expensive interests to all the parties involved manages to continue to keep running with some difficulties, but maybe that's actually a good thing. So Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, a few minor issues aside, you're actually pretty comfortable with how your legacy has been taken forward. Yeah, well, it was a lot of people's <laughs> legacy, right? I mean, I just happened to be occupying the chair. The, the odd thing about the chair position is I'm actually the only participant who doesn't get a vote. <laughs> um, so, so it's this weird yeah. position in some ways. So, But yeah, it is kind of gratifying that it still continues. And a lot of that, of course, is attributable to George, who you know, got the thing off the ground, and to Ono, and especially Patrick, who's kept it going for way longer than any of us did, so. Yeah, no, Patrick Patrick has been the chair as, as far back as I can remember. Yeah. <laughs> but it's really good to see that what he started with was really the foundation was laid by some of his predecessors in a, mm -hmm. in a very thoughtful way. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for cool. giving me a chance yeah. to chat about no, it with thanks you. Thanks very much. Um, so, you're welcome to one of the books if you like them. Oh, you may great. already have Thanks. that. And um, this is also an exclusive benefit of being on the Night Hacking stream. You get one of the um, laptop stickers. Awesome. All right. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rob. Take care.